Let me uh, welcome you to the United States Institute of Peace. Um, we are very proud uh, to be able to have the Secretary General's uh, representative, senior representative um, here, Mr. Ad Melkert, um, to talk to us today about what's going on in Baghdad and more broadly in, in Iraq. Um, as many of you know, uh, he had a uh, opportunity to present to the Security Council uh, two days ago, I believe. Um, and this is a great opportunity for us and people in this room and even beyond this room uh, to have an opportunity to get this update. And if he has some time, he is catching a, a train this afternoon. So I have to be sure that uh, I watch the clock. But I hope to be able to have an opportunity to ask uh, you for your questions uh, at this time. I would like for people to turn off their cell phones so they don't make any noise. Um, and I look forward to uh, having an opportunity to raise these issues uh, with you. But Mr. Well, one thing I should say: uh, yeah. the Dutch um, <laughs> have this have this uh, have this have this knack uh, for me being able to do difficult jobs in diplomacy and other areas. And uh, Mr. Melzer is, has, is is no exception. Uh, starting at the World Bank, um, uh, at the UN, uh, and now as the SRSG, um, he is in a very has been in difficult positions. This is probably the most difficult position. I sus you, you can you can say, but I suspect this is as difficult a job as, as he has had. So again, we are very pl pleased to have you here, sir. And the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Uh, I will uh, resist the temptation uh, to speculate on the result of the Dutch elections on 9th of June, <laughs> but it might be even more complicated than in Iraq uh, what uh, will be the aftermath of that day. But, uh, yes, I must admit that um, it is um, extraordinarily complicated, but also... Um, I would say very gratifying to be able to um, be in the position where I am and also having the opportunity this afternoon to share some impressions and, and thoughts and updates uh, with you. Uh, gratifying from the point of view of the UN uh, because um, uh, Baghdad, Iraq, is really a place where many um, dimensions of the classic UN missions come together to try to assist in a political process of transition, to try to continue to uh, provide humanitarian assistance, particularly for internally displaced and, and refugees, to work meanwhile on the transition from the stage of humanitarian assistance to development and policy advice for the new government, uh, in a potentially rich country, but where the organization of the priorities and the implementation of policy still requires a lot, particularly to ensure that the revenues will be of benefit uh, to most instead of just a few. And there is the human rights mandate with, with many issues, freedom of press, position of journalists, prisoners, um, position of women, uh, as um, uh, issues that actually deserve a lecture just by itself. This afternoon, um, I, I think it's best from my side to give you a few, um, uh, to share a few remarks on the political situation uh, after the elections and in view of the government formation, but of course other topics uh, could be uh, discussed as well and, and are uh, certainly as important. On the day, on the, the moment that we speak right now, um, we hope that uh, it's now a matter of days, but I might be still too optimistic, that uh, the uh, final result of the election will be ratified by the uh, Supreme Court. There are still a few uh, hiccups, um, uh, even these days with appeals, on certain candidates and even efforts to deduct votes from parties, uh, votes that have been cast uh, on the 7th of March. We have consistently advised the Independent High Electoral Commission that after the election date, no votes of parties could be deducted, regardless particular decisions on candidates in view of their background, 
um, not only the so-called debatification uh, and uh, the reference to the past of candidates, but also their educational qualifications or their criminal records. It's all part of reality. Uh, we have never um, stated our opinion on individual cases, but from the UN have very much advised on due process. Uh, that should, of course, include respect for the votes cast on the 7th of March. As it looks now, um, we're uh, very close to um, an outcome that is respecting that principle. Um, and we have had, of course, also the recount for the uh, Baghdad voting stations, which was about one-fifth of the total votes uh, cast. We were happy to see that uh, the margin of error was less than 0.1%, uh, so in, in that sense a very strong confirmation of the validity of the process and of uh, the count. And we believe that that has also um, um, helped many people to have uh, confidence that is possible in uh, Iraq to have a proper process uh, in place, and that's the start of everything, even if a lot of politics um, uh, follows, and that's, of course, very complicated in and by itself. Um, and having said that, I think that uh, I should actually start with the good news, and that is that uh, ever since the moment that the election law was agreed upon early December, uh, after lots of pulling and pushing, um, and when there were complaints at that time uh, in Iraq, but also from abroad and from international uh, media, including U.S. media, uh, I, I liked to make the point or the prediction that probably an election law in Iraq would be sooner agreed upon than the health bill in, um, in Washington. And that was indeed what happened. Uh, so that was uh, good at that time. And the good news further was that the election law was a firm basis for uh, preparations of the elections. I set aside the de debatification uh, issue. But by and large, the preparation was good. The election day was uh, truly an historic, <coughs> excuse me, truly an historic event with uh, more than 62% turnout. And not only that, but really people, visibly people, that were very happy to cast uh, their vote. And then we had a count and the recount, and I hope very soon we can say the rest is history. And the good news of that is that that is all according to the book, all according to the rules that had been um, uh, agreed upon in the Constitution. The Constitution is far from, from perfect, the election law was far from perfect, but given the history uh, of uh, Iraq, it is all progress in the making, uh, and every new step is a big step forward, and that is what I, how we, uh, I think, could characterize the e election process uh, to date. The circumstances um, in Iraq... Uh, are still in, in many ways of concern. Um, so that is maybe have good, have uh, less good news. Um, the have good news is that the um, ability of the government to govern and of the security forces to provide security um, has been greatly enhanced over the past two years or so, and that that is basically maintained uh, at those levels uh, as we speak. Um, and that's a far cry from the uh, high insecurity and the enormous levels of violence in 2006-2007. However, it is also true that uh, the level of violence at this moment is uh, very comparable uh, between January and this moment, this year, compared to the same period last year. And so that doesn't show the kind of progress that one would like to see. We're still talking about uh, around 2,000 uh, people killed since early January, more than 5,000 people injured, many incidents every day again, some parts of the country much more than in other parts of the country, but uh, certainly not yet a, a situation that would 
approach more satisfactory uh, um, uh, uh, levels or manageable uh, levels. And then the other news, and I, I really can't say at this moment whether it's good or, or bad, time will tell in the next few weeks and months, is that as we are now very close to the ratification of the results, the full weight of the further process will be on the shoulders of the political leaders to have a serious government formation process in place. And that's not self-evident how that's going to be organized. It's not self-evident from the political angle uh, because there are, of course, different uh, interests. And although the interesting result of the election is that there are four major lists, all those lists are, in fact, made up of different uh, interests that also within the lists are uh, certainly competing for uh, power and um, influence. And... Um, Another aspect that is very important is that there are no clear rules, no real customs, of course, also in place that guide the political leaders to the next stage. Officially, um, 15 days after the ratification of the results, the new parliament will be convened and the new parliament will have to elect a new speaker and the new president and then 15 days from then the president will ask a candidate prime minister to start form a government and if he wouldn't succeed there would be a next uh, turn but that sounds slightly more orderly than it probably probably will be and uh, just at the very start uh, of the stage after the ratification, uh, there will be a great responsibility for political leaders to try to organize the process um, in order to ensure that the Iraqi voters will understand why it was that they cast their vote on the 7th of March and also to avoid um, the sense uh, or anxiety that there could be a political vacuum uh, in the country, which is not necessarily the case because the, the outgoing government maintains authority over all decisions that are needed. Yet many countries know, of course, that in a transition to a new government, uh, the efficiency but also um, uh, or uh, the effectiveness but also the credibility of what the outgoing government does uh, is um, in a different context um, than uh, under normal circumstances. So to keep that period very briefly is extremely important. Now here, um, there are a few um, principles that could help um, the different actors to find their way, and that's also what the UN um, has advised and is advising them to do, but of course from the role that we have, which is advising at the request of the Iraqis, according to the mandate that the Security Council uh, has provided to us. One important principle is the inclusiveness of the government. Here I think that some steps forward uh, have been achieved, because before the elections there was, there were still, there was still quite much talk of a, a kind of majority government with a relatively small majority versus a relatively big minority in opposition. But more and more the understanding has grown that um, in a country like Iraq, in the situation where it is now, it might be uh, very much preferable to have actually the major lists also represented um, in the government. Um, and that principle is more and more uh, adhered to, although the, um, the risk still is that the process leading to that inclusive government wouldn't be very inclusive from the very beginning. In other words, that first two parties would come together and then a third party would come and then a fourth party would actually have uh, only a, a secondary uh, position or choice. And uh, that's one of the things that we uh, try to discuss with uh, political leaders, that it would be very important to have that process inclusive from the very beginning. A second principle is uh, that of power sharing. Actually, in my interaction with many parties and their leaders, uh, it struck me that there is a sense 
that uh, although the position of the Prime Minister in the Constitution is very clear and nobody basically wants to amend that, that in the um, management of uh, decision-making within uh, the Council of Ministers, it, it could be of great importance to have a clearer set of rules uh, for the Council of Ministers that are basically not existing at this point in time, maybe also with um, a clearer role for deputy uh, prime ministers or ministers in certain key areas, so that it would be clear that decisions would be taken more collectively, which is an essential feature of a coalition to succeed, as I know also myself from, from working in countries where making coalition governments is uh, the bread and butter of the, uh, of the politicians is not only your coalition agreement, it's also how you take decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. And a third principle, uh, although admittedly uh, I think that for the time being we're least successful with advocating uh, that point, is that in absence of very clear time limits in the Constitution, it could be helpful if politicians themselves would agree voluntarily on a kind of reasonable time period to try to put a government uh, together. Because as um, uh, more generally in life, but certainly also in politics, it helps to have certain deadlines or semi-deadlines, if not imposed, then in any case um, voluntarily um, agreed. And again, this is of course out of concern that the process um, might take so much time uh, that it would um, have uh, adverse consequences in, in different ways. So this is a bit the, um, the update of where we are now. Um, many things of what will happen may be part of speculation. Other things we might know and we might also try to position, to define our own position on that in how, as UN, we can advise and obviously whereas UN uh, not uh, the only international stakeholder uh, with uh, the U.S. Uh, government uh, still in a, in a very central position given the status of forces agreement that also will be a responsibility for the new Iraqi government at least until uh, the end of uh, 2011 and with the neighboring countries visibly interested and involved in the process there is, of course, a lot of uh, interaction between Iraq uh, and uh, the international uh, community. But uh, let me stop uh, here and, <coughs> and take uh, any further questions. Thank you very much. Very good. Very good. You mind if I uh, continue? That would be great. Here? That would be great if you would. Um, that works better for our friends in the back here. This is, this <laughs> is very good. Um, Mr. Melker, let me just ask you a question to follow up on your point about the lack of guiding principles for how this is all going to come together. You or others uh, have suggested the possibility of a roundtable that would, that would get the leaders together, presumably all four major lists. Um, does this uh, have resonance there? Is there a possibility that that could push them toward something in a restricted time frame that you suggested? Well, the suggestion of a roundtable uh, is actually um, uh, Iraqi-based, particularly um, uh, Amar Hakim from the um, uh, Islamic Supreme Council, so part of the uh, INA coalition, the Iraqi National Alliance. Um, and the Sadrists have made that suggestion actually quite soon in the process. Uh, they continue to repeat the suggestion. Um, for the time being, it was very difficult to um, bring parties around that table, um, partially because state of law coalition, uh, the prime minister's coalition, has very much uh, emphasized the need that first the electoral process should be finalized. Um, and they have been also very active, uh, actually until these days, uh, to uh, file appeals that prolong the process. Um, and partially, it is probably also the, the, the outcome of a an, an, an multitude of bilateral meetings that have been taking place and that are taking place between all major parties. 
and that have not yet led to the formula that would probably be satisfactory for parties to meet around one table. And one of, of those relevant bilateral contacts and developments is the agreement between State of Law Coalition and the Iraqi National Alliance, so the two uh, Shiite parties, uh, that have announced that there is uh, an agreement, although they are still working uh, at the elaboration of the implications of that agreement, but I think that many observers agree on the point that this is particularly meant to try to select a prime minister's candidate uh, who then would have uh, the support of two of the four blocks from the outset, and that might change conditions for a possible roundtable setting. One other question, and then we will open this up uh, more broadly, and I guess we will do this at the uh, – okay, very good. Um, as a politician, as a member of the parliament uh, in the Netherlands, um, and as a, as a minister, um, you have observed that during the formation of the government, during the period of time when, when the government is, be, is being negotiated and these discussions among parties, that may be an opportunity to solve some problems, or at least to address some problems, so that the government can have some views and pl a platform, uh, something to start off with when it is formed. Do you see that happening, or you, do you anticipate that happening as these uh, negotiations get serious as soon as the certification takes place? It's a very important point. Um, we observe some uh, indirect positive effects, actually, uh, of the fact that after elections, sometimes uh, things can be discussed uh, with a kind of new uh, energy and inspiration that is not always there when um, uh, before the elections for all kind of sensitivity reasons. Um, particularly uh, in the interaction between uh, Iraqia and the Kurdistan uh, alliance, we are seeing at this moment more possibilities than before to address some of the tensions in the province of Nineveh, uh, where after the provincial council elections in January 2009, the uh, Kurdish fraternal list uh, remained out of the provincial council and of the provincial administration, despite the fact that the Kurds are uh, representing around one-third of the population of Nineveh. So tensions between the the Arab side list, Hadba, and Kurdistan fraternal list have been high. There were frustrations at the side of the governor that he was not allowed to travel in his province, uh, as some parts of the province are controlled by the Kurdistan Peshmerga uh, forces in relation also to the joint security arrangements where the U.S. forces play a role with the Iraqi army and the uh, Peshmerga. There are issues, big issues, as you know, with minorities, particularly Christian uh, minorities in, in Inua. And there's a, a huge frustration at the side of, of many uh, Arabs that uh, there are detainees in Kurdistan who are either not known where they are or uh, they are in faraway prisons, cannot be visited by their families, etc. So on all these issues... Um, Deputy Prime Minister Isawi took an initiative last year to try to put an agreement together that would address basically uh, all these uh, questions. He got stuck. It was before the elections. It was too sensitive. And we have, with him, together with him, we have tried to pick it up. And with some noticeable progress at this moment, there is now a, c a committee uh, dealing with uh, classifying detainees uh, in the Kurdistan um, uh, region, anticipating possible release or transfer. We had just this week the first meeting of a committee on the protection of minorities with actually all major parties uh, and, of course, representatives of the minorities included. It will be difficult, but it is definitely a, 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 an important signal. The, the governor uh, has been uh, actually... Um, allowed, so to speak, to, to, to come closer, to be more consulted in issues that are relevant for the security in his province. And we hope that all of this will lead in the coming weeks or so to the uh, return of the Kurdish fraternal list in the provincial council. And by all means, that would be a very positive uh, signal, um, as there are also clear linkages with the wider agenda of the Arab-Kurdish relations 
on oil revenue sharing, disputed areas, and Kirkuk, which uh, certainly is, is a big issue for the future. And let me there make a second remark. One would hope that in the coming weeks um, some emphasis would also shift from the discussion about process and prime minister and key ministerial posts to the key programmatic objectives for a new government. Uh, the choice might be made, of course, to deal with that after a government is formed, I mean, that, and that would in itself be legitimate. But somehow, um, before a new government would be seated, there could be more space for compromise and for real understanding as to how to deal with these uh, very sensitive uh, issues. And we from the UN, in any case, try to encourage uh, our interlocutors to, to look at it that way and to consider uh, some, some options to address these. Very good. Uh, I'm going to ask one last question. I can see that uh, Besser Litt has already figured out how we're going to operate here. <laughs> and he has positioned himself in front of this microphone. Others who would like to ask questions uh, of the SRSG are invited to uh, uh, approach either microphone, and we will try to alternate back and forth. As you do that, if, if Besser Litt will give me one last uh, question. The, uh, the U.S. troop levels appear to be on track, uh, staying on track, despite all of the all of the events and uh, delays. Uh, they appear to be. What effect will these reduced uh, troop levels have on the U.N.? Well, um, in the short run, so now talking about the um, uh, planned withdrawal in the coming months leaving around 50,000 uh, still in the country. We, we do not foresee immediate uh, consequences, uh, and um, we have, of course, also, we're in close consultation with uh, the U.S. Uh, on that. However, the next step that is scheduled for uh, next year uh, will have uh, many consequences for the U.N., um, so this is what we will discuss with the membership uh, in New York in, in autumn, in terms of logistical support, protection support, uh, and, of course, the, um, uh, the finances that will be needed for that, which is not necessarily a popular topic uh, in an uh, era of uh, budget discipline. But for the UN to maintain its footprint uh, in Iraq, and not only in Baghdad and Erbil, which are, are, are two main bases at this moment, uh, it will be important uh, to, to be more supported by the membership. So the um, drawdown of the American forces has consequences. Yes. We are honored to have the Iraqi ambassador of the United States with us uh, here today. Um, at any time, Mr. Ambassador, you would like to uh, ask a question, you are welcome to do this. Well, maybe. Yeah, that would be fine. Just answer this one, so. uh, thank you. No, no, I'll just take the opportunity. Uh, to uh, follow up on this last point, you know, on the 19th of August 2003, we all witnessed the big tragedy of the attack against the United Nations. After that, we witnessed a retrenchment of the United Nations in terms of its attitude to security. There was a reluctance to expand its, its operation in Baghdad. A lot of its operations were run from Jordan, and in Baghdad their movement was, was restricted and so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, with, over the years, obviously this has to some extent relaxed. But uh, now with the advent of the withdrawal of American forces and reliance entirely on Iraqi security, is there a move within your um, team to... Um, relax further and operate in a more integral way with, in, in terms of circulating in Iraq and interfacing with ministries and, and leaders? Or are you still under the uh, worry uh, left by the last attack? Well, thank, thank you for that question and also the reference to the tragedy uh, in uh, 2003. Um, we, we must be realistic. Uh, it's certainly not any longer 2003 or 2006 or 7, 
but uh, analysis of what uh, some uh, groups have in mind in protesting against foreign presence in uh, Iraq is not only directed against uh, the U.S., but there are also others that uh, are very explicitly mentioned. So we must factor that in, whether it's right or wrong. They are certainly wrong in their assumption that the U.N. is there for any other interest than the strict U.N. mission and the impartiality, which is uh, the feature of our contribution. But that is, of course, not, not shared uh, or understood by, by everyone. Having said that, I do agree with you that the assumption for the U.N. to be there should be that we should be able to interact as much as possible with the people that we want to serve. Frankly, as a former politician, I find it uh, terrible that I, I don't have the opportunity that I did in my country all the time to go around uh, on markets and, and public places and schools or whatever uh, and to, to have this kind of feeling also for the, for the country that all of us must have. Fortunately, we have been able to have many more people that used to work from Amman now working from Baghdad or from Erbil or some other places. Uh, and we want to pursue that, but that is, of course, as circumstances uh, permit. Uh, and, but we are keenly aware of, of the need to do so. And I must also uh, acknowledge here that the, the performance and the quality of the Iraqi security forces has certainly increased on average, not everywhere to the same extent or uh, the, in the same level of reliability, but um, the Iraqi authorities are extremely serious in working on that, and I believe over time that will also be a very important supportive factor for our work. Thank you. Um, we'll start here. Okay. Yes, thanks. Uh, David Litt, a retired American Foreign Service officer, also at Embassy Baghdad a few years ago. Um, my question really was about the, uh, uh, the, uh, the shrinking of the American military presence, but could you uh, expand a little bit on some of the opportunities that you see that might be arising uh, now that the United States military may no longer be uh, may lo no longer have such a big presence, uh, in addition to some of the additional uh, risks to Iraq. Well, it's, it is it is quite difficult for me to to speak about that because um, um, part of it is is just speculation, and I would also not like to to have say a political interpretation of of any remark that I would like to make on this. Let me just say that last year, end of June, when the uh, American, most of the American combat forces withdrew uh, from the uh, urban uh, areas, there were uh, lots of, um, say, dark uh, expectations as to what that would entail. And one cannot say that that, that has come true. There have been some horrible uh, explosions um, uh, several, um, several times. But uh, on, on average, the, the level of uh, security has not suffered from, from that step, maybe even a bit on the contrary, although I would like to underscore the point that I made, that the levels of security are not really going down further than um, the, the drop um, that started maybe one and a half year um, ago. Uh, there is certainly a huge opportunity for the Iraqi security forces to impose themselves, and that's what we saw around the elections. The, the security arrangements around the elections were, were really quite strongly organized under the responsibility of the so-called Higher Security Committee that was um, uh, led by the Iraqi police uh, chief, um, uh, General Aydin, um, and, of course, the U.S. was there to back up, but uh, certainly the Iraqis led that operation, and they did so in a very professional and, uh, by and large, successful way. And I suppose that, that these kind of opportunities will also become more visible uh, the less U.S. troops uh, are, are there. And let's also face it that for some groups in society, the presence of U.S. troops has, of course, remained a matter of controversy even after the status of forces agreement as agreed with the government. So in that sense, also their withdrawal takes away for those groups uh, a bone of contention. Um, and uh, in, I, I would 
think that particularly what, what is going to happen in the course of this year should not really be of impact uh, on the uh, security uh, uh, situation. But let me stop here. <coughs> Please. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Ambassador Taylor, and thank you, Mr. Marker, for your uh, presentation. My name is uh, Ahmed Ali. I'm from the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. I have uh, two very quick questions. Uh, the first one, uh, you're right to point out that the right government uh, asks for unanimous advice and for unanimous participation. Uh, however, it seems that whenever it comes to a critical issue or sensitive issue and UNAMI does take a, an active role, it comes under criticism for being biased uh, for one party or another party. I'm referring to the election uh, law. Uh, there was some criticism towards UNAMI and then towards Kirkuk and the uh, DIPS as well. So I wonder if I could get uh, your reaction on that. Is that, uh, uh, is that damaging to UNAMI's efforts as it takes a a much more active role in the future, or is it just uh, for uh, public consumption and uh, political consumption, essentially? Uh, essentially. Uh, the second question is about the alleged uh, secret presence in Iraq. Uh, you know, the Iraq government says that they're not secret, uh, we know about them, uh, but then there's uh, another contention from the families uh, of, of the detainees. Uh, is Yonami doing anything to address that issue? Is it doing anything to work with the Iraq government to prevent uh, the the uh, proliferation proliferation of uh, of those uh, situations because uh, many Iraqis feel that the presence of U.S. troops is controversial, uh, but there are other Iraqis who think that if U.S. troops are they're concerned that if these presence are uh, existing right now they might even uh, double uh, when U.S. troops leave. Let me start with the, the, the second question. Yes, we're, we're certainly um, involved with uh, the issue and also expressing concern uh, whenever and wherever that is needed and justified, uh, also on the recent uh, examples. I mentioned this uh, committee on detainees in, in Nineveh, uh, so on detainees in the Kurdistan region, which is another example where we try to help to identify cases that sometimes were not known. But at the same time, that's also an interesting experience to demythologize a bit because the figures that were around about, say, uh, disappeared or, or not known detainees in the Kurdistan region were really in the thousands, according to some. But it turns out that we're talking some hundreds at maximum. So it all helps to, to bring... Uh, the real proportions to light, but then it's still a matter of concern. And for instance, uh, in the case of the Kurdistan region, uh, the, these uh, administrative detention issues where people are put in prison, actually without any process, uh, any due process starting uh, at any point, and this is happening in, in different parts of Iraq and uh, should be brought to the attention of the authorities. That's what we do with our regular um, uh, human rights reports and, and more than, than that. It is very important, although partially, of course, also kind of heritage of, uh, of, the, of previous years. But the normalization of that is certainly one of the human rights priorities. On your first point, uh, yes, um, UNAMI should, of course, be um, credible to, to all sides. I mean, impartiality is, is for me really the golden standard and, and frankly the only way in which um, UNAMI could operate. But impartiality doesn't mean that you don't have an opinion because there are certain standards that need to be adhered to, be it in an electoral process, being in, in the interaction between parties, being in, in just identifying the general interest of, of the people and the country. Admittedly, there's always a subjective element to it, but we're, of course, not in isolation doing that. We are guided <coughs> by the Security Council mandate and, if necessary, also the consultations with the Security Council members once every three months. I am in New York for these consultations. And as long as that backing is there and the backing is also there of major, the major actors in Iraqi politics, we can play our role, sometimes... Uh, take uh, a, a hit, but then um, um, like to cherish the idea that that's all for uh, for the better and for the for the future. Um, uh, but credibility, impartiality, um, and um, having access to all, 
that, that those are the key ingredients for our operation and the only way in which we can operate effectively. Sir. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Raid Mohammed. I'm a private citizen. My issue is the Iraqi diaspora. They have reached, I guess, beyond, you know, uh, saturation, beyond limit. Uh, they obviously have been anticipating for years, you know, to go back. In 2005, many European countries, including Germany, started reviewing Iraqi cases because a lot of them applied under the premise of Saddam Hussein, and he was gone. He, he was out of the picture. I had the opportunity to meet with President Bush, and I raised this issue with him shortly after Condoleezza Rice went to Europe, including Germany, and the subject more or less faded, you know, behind backgrounds. But lately, you know, with the sentiment against uh, refugees, against Muslims, Arabs in Europe, Netherlands, Germany, and, of course, the fallout, you know, the economical fallout, a lot of these Iraqis are very nervous, you know, and they really, you know, it's becoming a dangerous situation because they need to know what's happening in Iraq. The Iraqi refugees are living in Lumbo, you know, to try to extend their hand to them and help them and, and you know, be patient with their situation. And my other issue is that the ambassador raised the issue of 2003. So that takes us back to years. <clears throat> Is it, does the United Nations intend to indict people who played a big role in perpetuating the iron fist of Saddam Hussein from 1991 until 2003 by smuggling his oil and basically generating the money and the cash that he needs to further, you know, uh, brutalize the Iraqis while circumventing the United Nations sanctions, and I can supply you with a lot of names. I know a lot of them, a lot of them in person. They smuggled the precious metal out of Iraq through one bridge in Turkey. It's very clear, right under the nose of United Nations, in sloppy, you know, uh, obser observers. They were bribing everybody and, you know, smuggling Iraqi oil and bringing back to Saddam whatever he needed to continue his slaughter of, particularly in this case, Arab, uh, Sunnis, and Shia. So your question so is... So my question that. is, the United Nation, does the United Nation intend to open these files and prosecute some of these criminals who right now actually have, you know, strong yeah. hand yeah. in Iraq as we speak, controlling Iraqi yeah. fortunes and Iraqi population? Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I, I see your point uh, there, but uh, that is really beyond the mandate of, uh, of UNAMI, so the, the mission that, that I represent. So I, I prefer not, not to get into that because that's, uh, that's for a full afternoon, I suppose. Um, the uh, other point um, that you made, UNHCR, the High Commission for the Refugees, is certainly doing a lot uh, in Iraq, both for returning refugees and certainly also for internally displaced persons. Um, working with refugees, particularly in Jordan and uh, Syria, but also in some other countries, I think it's very hard to make a general statement or judgment on the position of refugees and also their opportunities to return and to return safely. In that sense, the situation in Iraq is very differentiated. Between, uh, there, are, there are huge differences between different parts of the country. Many refugees have returned successfully. I'm not in the position to second-guess the um, decisions by uh, countries that have enabled refugees to stay but now encourage them sometimes uh, to go back. So that's all I can say on, on that score, I suppose. Mr. Merkel, uh, the Institute of Peace is very pleased to welcome uh, the Institute for the Study of War. And uh, the next question will come from... Uh... Hello, I'm Kim Kagan, the president of the Institute for the Study of War. It's wonderful at long last to meet you since somehow I've missed you in Iraq every single time. <laughs> um, you had mentioned in your discussion of the principles guiding uh, the UN in... in 
its advice to Iraqi politicians on election formation, uh, that the risk of being exclusive uh, in government formation pertains not only to whether all parties are included in the government, but whether uh, major lists are included in the discussion of who will become prime minister. Um, it's the ongoing discussion right now between State of Law Coalition and the Iraqi National Alliance uh, over setting up a committee to select the prime minister, an inclusive process. Uh, and if it is, please explain why, if it is not, what are the kinds of ideas uh, that you or other Iraqis are surfacing uh, to try to create an inclusive process of selection? Will that only happen uh, if, in fact, Iraqia gets the first chance to form a government? Thanks. Well, it's, a, it's an important question, uh, not easy to answer, and I can certainly not explain what's going on. I can just observe. Um, and in my uh, observation, um, uh, I think it is in itself legitimate that two parties would come together and try to find a common basis for supporting basically anything, whether it's a programmatic objective or um, uh, the prime minister position. Uh, however, there are different statements from different actors under the INA state of law um, um, cooperation that have referred to the need not only to find, uh, say, support within their cooperation, but also to uh, check that, so to speak, with the position of other parties, so to consult them. Now, whether they will do that, how they will do that, and when that will happen, uh, I, I could not say. That, that is, uh, I think, unclear to any observer at this moment. But it doesn't exclude that that would also be part of the consideration. And let's not forget that even when um, uh, um, Iraq or uh, INA and State of Law together uh, are very close to a majority, but they don't have a stable majority, so you, you need... Um, at least a third uh, bloc or some smaller parties, but preferably actually more support for the prime minister. And I believe that point is actually widely recognized. So this is then perhaps more about the sequence of the process than necessarily inclusion or exclusion. Over time, it, it, it might serve also the purpose of exclusion. Whether that will be interpreted at the other side the same way is a totally different question. Mr. Merkel, if I could follow up on Kim's uh, question there. One of your principles that you mentioned uh, is government coalition inclusive of all major winning lists. What would that look like? Is, that, is there not an opposition in that formulation? What does, uh, how does it work? Well, I've, I've made the point to the Security Council um, this, this week that, uh, yes, if you would have all major lists included in the government, you could not speak of the, say, the governing minority, uh, majority versus the, uh, the opposition minority. But I've made the point that probably the inclusiveness of the government is the radical alternative to the exclusion of many communities and many people in governments in Iraq in the past. So that in that sense, if, if, if it's really about change, mm -hmm. this, this, this could be a, a very good way of um, representing that, that feeling uh, and that uh, desire for change that was probably also around at the time that the voters cast their vote. That, of course, does not pre preclude the parliament from um, fulfilling its role as a controlling organ in the framework of constitutional checks and balances. And interestingly, I observe that um, within different parties, some people are working on improving the procedures in Parliament um, and basically making sure that the Parliament can show its teeth when it's necessary to those that, uh, that, uh, that have the authority in the different areas. Um, and that is not necessarily along party lines that you could develop that. And I believe we could also support parties in, in that, and that could uh, improve uh, the, the role of the demo or, the, or the, the development of the democratic process in the near future very well. Very good, sir. Um, to respect your uh, 
train ticket. Uh, why don't we take the last, these be the last three questions, um, and we will go here. Mr. Melkert, Ambassador Taylor, thank you for speaking with us today. Uh, I just have two quick questions. Looking beyond government formation, what do you see, um, what are the key challenges Iraq is going to face in the neighborhood, Iraqi foreign policy? And specifically, how do you see or what role will UNAMI play in helping Iraq to fulfill its Chapter 7 obligations? Well, um, the, the foreign policy equation is, is very complex, as you, as you doubtlessly know. Um, looking back over the past few years, um, there has certainly been some, some problems in Iraq's initial ambition and also something that was very much supported from the Security Council perspective to be part of, say, a wider neighborhood regional development because, the, the say, the level of interaction bilaterally with uh, different neighboring countries is, is different. Um, you know that uh, after last August, uh, the uh, relations with Syria got tense. The relations with Saudi Arabia are not uh, at the level of um, uh, ambassadors. Only very recently, an Iraqi ambassador uh, has been appointed for um, uh, Kuwait. Uh, and at the same time, we see a very high level of involvement of, of particularly Iran and Turkey uh, in different ways and, and for different reasons, but uh, certainly part also of the political and economic interaction in the region. We try to um, advise all parties that it would be important for a new government to develop, uh, say, a, a more multilateral approach also towards relations in the region because there's, there's an enormous potential in the region. I don't need to explain that. Uh, and yet it is, it is very much um, uh, underused. Uh, um, one might perhaps speculate that the, the, the high intensity of interaction between capitals and many political leaders could probably improve the um, opportunities for such neighborhood uh, relations. Interestingly, um, both from uh, Iran and from Saudi Arabia, like from other capitals, the, the point has been made that it would be in the interest of Iraq to have an, an, a government inclusive of all lists. That was not immediately or originally the same thing that was said by everyone, but the, the one, we have seen a certain convergence of, uh, of ideas, and hopefully that could also be a platform for progress then uh, after, uh, the new, after the government formation. Now on Chapter 7, that is something that, that uh, is a very important point for uh, all Iraqi part, uh, parties, that the Chapter 7 sanctions that are still in place after the going back to the Gulf War 1990-1991 that um, uh, Iraq could exit from these which in itself makes perfect sense but there are a number of conditions that need to be fulfilled and one of the key points is really um, an unambiguous uh, reaffirmation of the borders between Iraq and Kuwait as designed in uh, Resolution 833 in 1993. Uh, so this is a very much a political matter, and then there are important issues about missing persons, about compensation payments, the border maintenance, that should relatively easily uh, be addressed um, uh, once that political clarification <coughs> would have been provided. And this is one of the issues where I hope that the post-election uh, space will turn out to be bigger than the pre-election space because it was very difficult actually to bring parties together on that point. Clearly the UN has, uh, has a role also in this. The Security Council must decide on that eventually and we'll try to work uh, into that direction. Thank you. My question is about the judiciary in Iraq and there have been a number of attempts by uh, political actors to co-opt or influence the judicial branch of Iraq to, uh, to, in my view, undermine the democratic process. And uh, the debathification being one, 
the large number of arrests of members of one particular party being another, and there continue to be appeals uh, today uh, to the judicial branch to try to influence um, the outcome of the election. And my comment to you is it seems to me that the U.N. and you in particular have been uh, somewhat quiet on some of these issues, and I was wondering if you could comment on your view of how, how serious are these issues and what's the degree to which they threaten to undermine the democratic process. Thanks. Well, let me say I, I really do appreciate your uh, question. I think it's an important question, but I also beg uh, for some understanding that I will remain relatively quiet in uh, my answer because um, at, at some points, uh, some moments where uh, there, was, there were reasons for concern, we have certainly not uh, hidden uh, our opinion on, on that. But um, my preference is there to play, and not only there, we do that more often, a, a more discreet role, because first and foremost it is important that there is an acceptance of the role of the judiciary as the arbiter in, in, uh, in processes and to cut through stalemates, um, to have an understanding by all parties that in a constitutional system the judiciary has to play its role, which sometimes can even be more important than whether you like or dislike the outcome uh, of that uh, role uh, that the judiciary is, is playing. So there are these two interests at the same time that we have to factor in also in terms of what we advise and with whom we uh, speak. But um, uh, let me uh, just say that uh, nothing escapes us. <laughs> Last question. Uh, sir, my question is regarding the uh, current disagreements in the interpretation uh, of the constitutional article that governs mm -hmm. the definition of the largest block that gets the first shot at forming the government. And there's certainly some, disambigu some ambiguity in uh, explaining the second part as to who gets the second shot if the first one fails. Uh, would you say that this is an irrelevant point of formality that at the end of the day it's the uh, block that actually gets the support of 163 or, uh, can, uh, voters that are going to form the government, or is it actually a matter that, uh, of importance in the sequence of the process? And if it is, uh, what kind of role uh, does UNAMI play in, in resolving this dispute? Thank you. Well, thank you for that question, and uh, Chairman, also for allowing the most difficult question <laughs> to be asked uh, as the last one. Um, um, it is, of course, an important question, which also has, has gotten uh, considerable political weight. Uh, yet, um, I, I can share with you, as, as I did with uh, Mr. Alawi, Mr. Maliki, and others, that uh, I think it is important really to make a, a distinction between the not unimportant uh, form, formality of who would be asked by the president to have the first try to form a government and the political reality which, which has much more weight as to where is the majority for um, anyone who would want to be prime minister in the likelihood that actually clarity about where that majority is will have been achieved already before even the president will be in the position to formally ask uh, a candidate prime minister to start forming a government. This goes also back to the experience four years ago, although I, I certainly would, would not like, uh, would not prefer to see a repetition of that process, but where it actually, where Parliament, uh, after convening, uh, kept its session open for a very long period of time until such time that there was uh, clarity about the political agreement on all the major positions, Prime Minister, Speaker, President, and, and some other uh, important uh, uh, issues with regard to the new government. So in other words, um, whilst it is understandable that uh, Iraqia uh, is, is happy in the first place that they had most seats and that they referred to that uh, constitutional uh, article, there was also the reality uh, that uh, a non-binding opinion from the Supreme Court had been asked by state of law that said 
it can be uh, either the, the winner of the elections or the largest bloc uh, after uh, elections. So once Parliament is formed and a bloc comes together, and there is, of course, speculation that INA and State of Law could be there together, and then they would have more seats than uh, Iraqia. But my point remains that apart from all the subtleties there and the legal uh, interpretations, um, my advice to parties is, is really to focus on the politics and to understand that in a system uh, of minority parties, the electorate does not directly elect the prime minister. The prime minister is the result of the coalition formation process, and that is majority-based, so it's better to look at the end of the process than to focus all attention and maybe controversy on the start uh, of the process. Mr. Melker, let me, on behalf of everyone here and those uh, viewing this, uh, thank you very much for taking the time here to speak to the American people and the folks in this room. Uh, uh, you've got a very difficult job, as you know better than anyone, and we are very lucky that there's a Dutchman at the helm here, and we have the best, best of luck. But join me in thanking uh, <laughs>